مرحبا جميعا خلونا ننتظر بس دقيقة أو دقيقتين على بال ما يوصلوا يدخلوا باقي الزملاء لو كل واحد بس في الشات يكتب لنا بس من أي دولة هو بيحضر الزوم بيحضر الوبنار خالد من فلسطين، وضاح من اليمن، عدنان من اليمن، خديجة المداح من المغرب، مرحبا حسام، ليال نصر من لبنان، خالد رجب من مصر، محمد من اليمن، خالد رجب، آه ميس من تركيا، مرحبا جميعا، يوسف، مرحبا يوسف، رويدة، مرحبا رويدة، دريس من اليمن مشاركين من اليمن مكتسحين الويبنار دكتورة سمر من الأردن مرحبا دكتورة كيفك آه يوسف آه من هولندا بس الأصل من إيجبت آه أحمد فوزي من اليمن وطن من فلسطين محمد المصر ياسر فتحي من مصر مها من مصر آيات خيري من مصر مرحبا آيات عبد الفتاح شريف يعني المكتسحين اليمنيين والمصريين وبعدهم الأردن طيب خلونا نبدأ يا جماعة آه عشان الوقت آه مرحبا جميعا آه سعداء ان نكون معكم اليوم في الويبنار الاول من دلي آه والذي يغطي موضوع استخدام تقنيه تحديد المواقع للتحقق من محتوى الفيديو والصور آه ياتي هذا الويبنار آه ضمن سلسله من الويبنارات التي تقدمها الشبكه العربيه لمتقي المعلومات اي اف سي ان ضمن مشروع دلي والذي يستهدف سبع دول عربيه وهي الاردن العراق، فلسطين، لبنان، تونس، المغرب واليمن ويدعم مشروع دليل الاتحاد الأوروبي وتنفذه مؤسسة سايرن بالتعاون مع FCN والجمعية الأردنية للمصدر المفتوح جوسا سيتم تغطية محاور مختلفة خلال الويبنار وتوضيح إشكاليات مختلفة حول تدقيق محتوى الفيديوهات والصور بواسطة مجموعة من الأدوات ودراسة حالات والأهم من ذلك تحديد منهجيات عند العمل على هكذا نوع من تدقيق المعلومات سيكون معنا اليوم في هذا الوبناء أوان سويني الخبير والمتخصص في استخبارات المصادر المفتوحة أوسنت ومدرب ساعد في إنشاء وتطوير ودعم عمليات تدقيق المعلومات والتحقق الرقمي في وسائل الإعلام في جميع أنحاء العالم في عام 2018 أنشأ أوسنت إسنشيالز التي توفر الموارد والخبرة للتحقيقات مفتوحة في المصدر والتربية الإعلامية. آه مرحبا أوان. وقبل ما نبدأ آه في تحت آه آه اللي حابب يحط أي سؤال يحطه على الكيو إن دي واللي آه عشان بس آه ننظم مجموعة ننظم الأسئلة والإجابة عليها بتكون بشكل متسلسل آه بحسب المحاور اللي حيبدأ فيها أوان. آه فمرحبا أوان. آه you can start. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mohammed. Thank you all of you here, and thank you everybody who is attending. Uh, this is something I'm very excited about, and it's a huge pleasure and a privilege for me to be addressing this group. Uh, biggest reason is because so much of what I learned in the whole field of open source intelligence and verification and specifically the thing we're going to talk about today geolocation was inspired by this region of the world because 
About 12 years ago, I joined a small startup in Dublin. I'm originally from Ireland, although I live in Germany now. I joined this small startup called Storyful. And at the time, our idea was that there will almost always be someone closer to a breaking story than a journalist. So it was about trying to find out what was reliable and what was not. And of course, the biggest news story in the world at the time was this wave of movements across Middle East, North Africa region, which came to be known popularly as the Arab Spring. And of course, a lot of this involved activism of one kind or another. And in certain places, that's where all of our information had to come from. Because for example, large parts of Syria, of Yemen, of Bahrain and other places uh, became un unsafe to a degree for professional journalists. So we were having to try to get a lot of our information from locally based sources. We got a lot of material, for example, in Syria from what became known as the local coordination committees. And of course, with activists, regardless of whether you sympathize or agree with them or not, you have to accept that they have a specific agenda. I mean, we all have an agenda of some kind, but with activists, naturally, by their very nature, they will be quite committed to an agenda. And that makes it all the more important to try to figure out exactly what they're providing, exactly what's going on, and so on. So it was important for us to try to figure out who sources were, why they were in certain places, where they were, which is going to be the thrust of today's uh, lessons and today's uh, presentation, because that was the biggest thing. A lot of stuff was coming out of Syria, out of Bahrain, out of Yemen, out of Egypt, and out of all these different countries that for the average Westerner or European, it was not that easy, not having local experience, it was not that easy to say immediately, oh, well, that's Thais, or that's Kaframbil, uh, uh, or that's somewhere else. So we had to find out quickly how we could figure these things out. And this brought us to this uh, discipline that we call geolocation. Now, geolocation is a sim simple word for trying to figure out where something came from, whether it be a photograph or a piece of video. And to me, it's always been my favorite part of online investigations because you get visual confirmation of the thing you're trying to find out. Investigating sources can be a bit more like a, an investigation uh, of a, a criminal situation or something like that, where you're trying to build probability. And you will very often end up with, well, this is likely the source and so on. Whereas with geolocation, you very often end up with a piece of video or a photograph and then a map view. And you can say, yes, 100%, these are the same. Therefore, this video or this photograph was captured in this location. So I've always found it very satisfying, uh, almost like a mix of playing games and doing detective work. And so often you have this eureka moment where you've been searching and searching for something and suddenly you get exactly what you want. So it is something that's very enjoyable. I will stress this again at the end that above anything else, what will make you good at geolocation is constantly doing it and practicing it. And fortunately with geolocation, it can be a lot of fun to practice. So I don't think that's going to be a big problem for people. So we will go through the basic principles, we will talk about tools, and then tips and things that might not have occurred to people initially, but you will find out, some people say to me, one question I get asked very often, what are the most important tools for geolocation or for verification? And I'm not joking when I answer them and I say stubbornness and imagination. You have to try to approach things from different angles. You have to not want to give up. You have to be like, I don't know, a dog trying to pull a bone out or something that you will always get more success the more uh, effort and the more creativity you put into it. And I will start out with a case study that will give you an example of that kind of thing. And it will look like 
a little bit complicated at first, but by the time I get through the first case study, you'll see that it was actually using quite simple tools and techniques. So uh, with questions and things like that, we will try to save as many as possible to the end, because what happens sometimes is somebody will ask me a question and the answer will be, oh, I was just about to get to that. So if you have a question in your mind, it may be answered in a few minutes. If not, keep it till the end. And I'll try to give a good portion of time over. Uh, I will also have a couple of little puzzles or exercises that we can try out before we finish also. But for now, I'm going to go straight into presenting as much information as I can squeeze into the next hour and a half to two hours. So as I say, we refer to this as geolocation. And yeah, it sounds like a, a fancy or scientific term for what's basically just trying to find points of correspondence, points of coincidence, and make sure that what we're looking at is where we thought it was or where it was claimed to be. Uh, also, at this point, I want to say thank you very much to the people providing the interpreting, because these are people I'm always in awe of. I think they have amazing skills. It's almost like having two brains. But please, uh, if I do get a little bit too fast at any time, please feel free to tell me, slow down. Because I, I do love, thank you. I do love this field and I can get a little bit overexcited at times because there's so much I want to say about it. So don't ever feel rude or anything. Please butt in on me at any time. So the first thing I'm going to show you is going right back to the final days before Russia launched its full-scale invasion of Ukraine early last year. And in the run-up to this, there was a lot of material appearing online and a lot of claims being made and counterclaims and denials. And people were saying, Russian troops are massing close to the Ukrainian border. And of course, uh, Russian officials were saying this is not the case. Those are just videos randomly from anywhere in Russia and pretending to be close to Ukraine so that you know, Ukraine can build up arms and so on. And this is all an agenda against Russia. So it was important when people were making these kind of claims to examine how credible the claims were. And the more you could find that proved that large troop concentrations were getting close to the Ukrainian border, then obviously the more credibility those claims would have. So I was looking quite a bit because at the time, there wasn't really any kind of a major clampdown on sharing of information on social media going on in Russia. They were quite casual. I think there was a bit of complacency. Maybe they thought, well, by the time people find out what's going on, it'll be too late. The invasion will finish in two or three days, and then it's a fait accompli, and we don't have to worry. So I think they were a little bit overconfident about this, and that meant that they did not really control the flow of information and the amount of info that was coming out on social media. What was very popular in Russia at the time, and still is, is TikTok. And it's not a platform I particularly enjoy dealing with, uh, there's a lot of, let's be honest, garbage on the platform. But in the weeks coming up to the invasion, there was a lot of stuff appearing on TikTok showing troop convoys, large concentrations of soldiers and materiel and so on. And the task really was, can we say where any of this is appearing? And sometimes it was easier than others. Sometimes you would see them in a town in front of a signpost and you could say well we know exactly where they are sometimes it wasn't like that so this was a video just a few days before the full-scale invasion started that i spotted on TikTok. and if you look at the video one thing you will notice is how little background visual information there is there you're just seeing a dull overcast sky, some very ragged looking vegetation and trees, and a road where there is no signage of any kind. You don't see any signs for any place. There's nothing on the road itself to indicate where this might be. And it doesn't look particularly promising. However, I'll just go forward off this one. 
The first thing I did when I wanted to see, could I get any hints as to roughly what region this was in was, I looked at the comments on the video. Now, I don't speak a word of Russian or Ukrainian, but of course we do have tools for translation. And sometimes if I'm in a group and I'm teaching them and there are any professional translators or interpreters there, I know who they are because as soon as I say Google Translate, they say, oh no. But don't forget, all we're looking for with these translation tools is information. We're not trying to write poetry. We're not trying to write novels. We just want to get information. So I looked at the comments on this video and you can see about halfway down there, somebody asks a question because there's a question mark and the person who posted the video in the first place seems to make some kind of an answer. There's also a number there. And when you've been doing this for a while, you start to get certain kinds of hunches and ideas. And the hunch that occurred to me here was, could this be a road number or something like that? It says M4, and that's quite a common designation you would get, particularly in Europe. So here was the M4, and I thought this could be a clue. Let's have a look. Let's translate this using Google Translate. And the Google Translate brings it up as M4 Don after Rostov towards Moscow. So again, yes, that looks like it might be a road. I went to Yandex Maps. Now, I had a look at Google first, and I wasn't really satisfied with what I was seeing. Now, Yandex is a major company that originated in Russia. And because of that, you tend to have a lot of information around Russia, Belarus, uh, previously a lot in Ukraine as well, although that's been largely shut down. But I thought it may be a good place to start looking for something that could be in Russia. So I went to Yandex Maps and I searched for M4 Don, which was what had come up in the message there. And sure enough, there is this, a road called M4 Don running northward from, you can see down the bottom, it says Rostov on Don and running toward Moscow. And if you recall, the message said M4 Don after Rostov going to Moscow. So I went back again and had another look. And of course, when we're talking about locations and that kind of thing, there's one very relevant thing you can see in the video there, which is a phone with a GPS on it. And to me, that was that looked like a potential goldmine of information. So I thought, let's see, can we get a better look at this? I went into it, and at the top left, it's hard for you to see it now on your screen. I was using a, a high-definition 27-inch screen. But right up the top left there, it also says E115. Now, the M4 Don is a very long motorway that runs for several hundred kilometers. But I thought, could there be a sub-designation, a, a section where it's called E115. Again, this is just a hunch from experience and from curiosity. But sure enough, when I went back to Yandex Maps, you can see that for quite a bit of its uh, journey, that M4 is designated as E115. So I thought this is now narrowing things down a little bit for me. Now, the message again said after Rostov. So I thought, well, in that case, maybe Rostov is the last major town this person had gone through before they posted the message. If they had gone to one of these places further north, Milerovo, Bogachar, maybe they would have mentioned that. Again, we're still trying to make educated guesses at this point. We have nothing 100% except the, the road numbers. But to me, I thought, here's Rostov. We're probably talking about somewhere in this area. So I went back again and had another look at the GPS. Is there anything else there that might help? And what drew my eye at this point was this geographical feature you can see down near the bottom of the map on the GPS. There's something running off to the right-hand side, so to the east of the road, with some kind of a triangular shape on it. And uh, this is not zoomed in very far, so I would expect that to be visible on satellite or map views. So I went back again to have a look at this. And after going up and down the map, just a little bit north of Rostov on Don in Yandex maps, I found this, which looked very promising to me. You had this triangular shaped feature going off again to the east. And I even overlaid the video onto the map 
And as you can see, it matches exactly. So we now know where on the map this car appears to be, or this vehicle with this GPS in it. Back I went again, had another look at the GPS. And of course, what else can you see on the GPS? There's a little moving object there. What's that? That's the GPS itself as represented on its screen, and by extension, the vehicle in which it's traveling. So looking at that, we see it's just to the south of that triangular feature. So we can place the car at the time that the video is shot, right here. Now, can we go in and get a ground level view that we can compare with the video? And at this point, I was a bit frustrated and disappointed. Yandex Maps does have a feature called Panorama, which brings you down to street level. Unfortunately for this area, there was no Panorama view available. So I did say about being stubborn, and I thought, well, let's try some other maps. And I went to Google. And Google did have a street view here. But the funny thing was, in the map view, you can't see that feature. But I had taken the latitude and longitude coordinates from Yandex Maps and put them into Google and search. So to me, this is the area. But unfortunately, they don't have that uh, geographical feature on the map. However, I switched to satellite view. And now suddenly you can see something that looks very similar there. So those lines that we see running away to the east of the highway are actually hedgerows or lines of trees or bushes. What was even better for me was that Google Maps does indeed in this area have street view. Now, it's obviously taken in a different season to when the video was shot, because in the video, everything is bare. There are no, there's no foliage on the trees. But of course, this was happening in the middle of February. So at this point, there's very little visual information. You have to start looking for little things that may stand out. And one thing that struck me was, well, on that line of trees to the right-hand side of the road, there are a couple of them that stand up above the others. That's not probably going to be enough in itself because coincidentally, you could have those in a lot of places. But there's another one then further along. So if you see the first few on the video, and then you let the video roll, about 30 or 40 meters further along, there should be a, another tall bush, but this time a little bit broader. So at this point in the video, you can see what looks quite promising as the first set of bushes. So in, in this situation, you're thinking, please now, when I go a little bit further in the video, I should see the large, broader bush. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. So now I'm practically certain that I'm in the right spot, but I'm a little bit obsessive about these things. And I thought, is there anything else? And when you go back and you look at this spot, you can see that as the car drives by the first set of tall trees there, an accident barrier emerges and then runs along the side of the road. You should see that in the video. Sure enough, just at that point of the video, you can see the barrier emerging from the ground there. As you watch the video, that barrier runs for a couple of hundred meters and then goes back into the ground just as you come to, oh, my slide's not going far, there we go, just as you come to that line of trees running off to the right. So there's far too much visual information coinciding here at this point for this to be anything other than absolute uh, verification. And as I said, if, when you go back and look at the original Yandex maps, you see that Rostov on Don and this highway are indeed very close to the Ukrainian border. So now having gone through all this uh, routine, we can see that this video shot on that particular date is showing a troop concentration of Russian military vehicles very close to the Ukrainian border. You can actually see on the map view there, the little camera sticking up out of the top of the Google car. That's what the shadow is near the bottom. طيب أوان قبل ما نبدأ بس ما هل في سؤال بكذر ما هي المهارات الأساسية اللي يجب أن تتوفر في مدقق المعلومات أو مدقق المعلومات أو الصحفي أو الصحفية أو المهتمين بال بما يخص تدقيق المحتوى الفيديوهات الصور يعني أنا لاحظت إنه أنت بدأت بملاحظة بسيطة حول الفيديو وبعدين انتقلت مثلاً للمواقع اللي ممكن تساعدك في استكشاف المكان وبعدين رجعت كمان 
اشتغلت على موضوع الملاحظات فما هي المهارات الأساسية اللي ممكن لازم نتواجد مثلا في الشخص اللي ممكن يشتغل على هيك أنواع من تدقيق الفيديوهات أو الصور Yeah, I, I'm a little worried that that may take us away from what's supposed to be the focus of, of today's workshop. I can, by all means, talk about it. Uh, it may be a good idea to circle back to it toward the end of the presentation, because at that point, we're talking about things that stray quite far from geolocation. Uh, but, but please uh, do take the time again toward the end, and I, I will talk more about that. I want to try to focus tightly on the specific theme for the moment, and we can talk about that a little bit later, if that's okay. Okay. So, so that one that we just looked at there, it, we went from having very, very little visual information to having 100% confirmation that it was the right place. And what's important there is that there was no magic involved in that. There was just Google Translate for the messages, or the comments, Yandex Maps, Google Maps for the street level view, and then some calculated guesswork based on experience and based on the information that we had. So there was nothing amazing involved there. There was no, no magic button. It was just a very basic uh, geolocation exercise. So what are the kind of things that we need to go into when we talk geolocation? The most essential things, of course, are, first of all, always examine the background. Because if you're a journalist and you see a video or a photograph of a dramatic incident, of course, your eye will be drawn to the incident itself. And by all means, do look at it carefully. But in terms of making it good for geolocation, you'll then have to watch the video again or look at the photo again and more carefully and look at what else you can see there because you know, a police officer and a demonstrator fighting is going to give you very little information in terms of geolocation. But if you can see the street that they're fighting on, then you have a very strong chance of establishing where this is. Becoming absolutely familiar with uh, online mapping applications is extremely important because number one, it will help you to understand the different features that you can use to your advantage. And also, it will speed up and make your workflow a lot more efficient. I see people now who are very good at, you know, they don't even touch the mouse. They're just working with the keyboard all the time because they know all the shortcuts and so on. So just even messing around with the maps, if you're going on a trip somewhere, uh, you can preview, you can have a, an advanced guided tour for yourself by just playing around with things like Google Maps and other mapping applications. I will go into others. Google is kind of the, the dominant player in this field, but there are others, and I'll talk about why. Then, of course, you're looking for points of correspondence. So you're looking for things that you can say, this is in the video, it's on the map. That's in the video, that's on the map. Here they are in relation to one another. So these are the kind of things you're looking for. And don't forget, even though it's a very visual medium, and we're talking about images, we're talking about videos, the text is going to be important also. And it was something, again, during uh, the Arab Spring, it was something that became very important to us quickly was trying to figure out place names because uh, in Syria in particular, a lot of the activists, if they were holding a demonstration, they would sometimes hold up a little card in front of the camera at the start with the place name. So we had to try to figure out what these place names were. The first time we actually got an Arab, Arabic speaker in our office was fantastic because that just cut out a lot of our guesswork. But look at captions. It might even mention street names or local monuments or stuff like that. And these things will all help. So don't ignore the descriptions and the captions. You know, on YouTube, if it's a long caption, you might have to click on a little button that says see more. And there could be very useful information included in that. So here's just an example of a very simple geolocation uh, task. So this is a video uh, from that claims to be from Mexico City, uh, this big artery that runs right down to the center of the city called Paseo de la Reforma. And there was a protest about fuel prices. And I wanted to see, is this actually where it says it is? So you're looking for objects and features and seeing can you then find them 
in the maps as well. And also what can be crucial is to compare spatial relationships, because if there's, for example, a McDonald's in a video, well, again, it could be anywhere. But if there's a McDonald's and it's directly across the street from, uh, I don't know, a Zara store or something like that, and then next to the Zara, there's a bar or something. Now you've got a spatial relationship that makes this far more likely to be correct. So when you look at this, it's paused at a point in the video. There are things you can pick out straight away and say to yourself, I should be able to find these things on a map. You have the tall buildings in the business districts off in the distance. A little closer, you have this long rectangular building with a uh, some kind of plaque or something on the side of it. And maybe if you're looking, you might even be able to see some of these distinctive trees. This is the uh, Google Street View of the spot. Uh, so I went in and I had a, a rough idea of where I thought the person with the video camera may be standing. And sure enough, you see exactly the same scene. So you've got the tall buildings, you've got the long building with the plaque on the side, and you even have the tree. And you can even also see this uh, distinctive median in the middle of the street there with the triangular uh, triangular pattern on it. And just right over on the right of the video here, you can see that. But if you were to play this video, you'll see more of those triangular structures. At this point in the video, right down at the end, you can see at the bottom left of the uh, red square, there is some kind of a tall, thin object. And here on the Google Street View, you can see that's the Angel of Independence monument. And if you run more through that video, again, you can also see that monument more clearly. So again, 100%, you can know that this is where it claims to be. So what are the kind of things we will look for when we're trying to do uh, geolocation? The answer is pretty much anything. It's limited, as I say, only by your imagination. There are many things that will help you figure things out. Street layouts, as you see in the first one there, you can see a large street going up. There's a kind of an open area. There is an elevated road going across as well. And some of you will be familiar with uh, Bellingcat. And I remember them in their early days. They've become one of the biggest uh, open source intelligence groups in the world now. In the early days, I remember talking to Elliot Higgins, the guy who started Bellingcat. And Elliot had this interesting approach where he would look at a video and he'd get a pencil and paper and he would try to draw a map of the streets that he was seeing in the video. Then he would go to Google Maps, he would hold up his piece of paper and compare it with Google Maps. I used to call it the, the analog slash digital approach. He was using the very old technology with the pencil and paper, but then actually using the computer to help him along. So these kind of things, you know, streets will be distinctive in many parts of the world. Uh, the next thing then I say statues and monuments, because if you see a statue or a monument, you can then search and you may get other pictures, you may get other videos that will confirm that it's the particular one that you were looking at in your photo or in your video. Look for architectural details, look for distinctive buildings. Are there particular shapes? Are there towers or minarets or gates or anything like this? that again, will prove to be distinctive. I used to joke with people early on that I spent half of my life counting windows because quite often on a building, you'll see, oh, okay, it has three windows high and it has six windows across. I felt like I was doing the, the Times crossword or something, but uh, very often this was a way of correlating and saying, yes, that is the right building. You're not always going to get something as dramatic as uh, this picture here. It may be just an apartment block, but does the apartment block have the same number of windows? Is the door in the same place? Is there some kind of structure on the roof? All of these things will help you. Then below that, I have street signs and shop fronts. And this is something that's, again, helpful because anything that has text, again, you can go to Google or whatever your favorite search engine is and get more information. I was helping some activists a few years ago in Chad in Africa, which you know one of the poorest countries in Africa, and the guy was asking me, how can we get our videos onto the news? And I said to him, the biggest thing is make them verifiable. And I said, you know, is there anything around when you're shooting a video? Do it in one take, pan around, try to get signs or stuff. And he said, the problem is that we hold most of our protests at night. And even though N'Djamena is our capital city, a lot of parts of the city, there's no light at night. 
And he showed me a video he had shot of protesters and police facing off. And I said, where were you when you shot that? And he said, I was standing in the doorway of a shop. And I said, has the shop got a light? Yes. Has the shop got a sign? Yes. I said, okay, the next one of those you shoot, pan around and get me that sign, which he did. And that, of course, instantly made it much easier to geolocate and verify the location. The last one I have on this page is license plates. Yes, of course, vehicles by their nature may not be in the place where they originated from. But if you're looking at a video and it says this video was shot in Buenos Aires and all of the number plates look like they came from Iraq, well, then you have to be suspicious immediately. So that's more of an approximation of where something may be. Other things you could have a, are the clothes people are wearing, uh, plants or trees or things that appear in a video. Uh, Food. There's so many things that can give you a hint of a location. So just always try to think of as many of them as you can. So first of all, the main tools you will be using when you're talking about locations will, of course, be maps. Uh, Google Maps obviously has the biggest index of locations. It has the most imagery. It has the most cover worldwide. So you really should be getting to know Google Maps if you're thinking about working in geolocation. Uh, it's not going to be the only one, but I would say more than 90% of the time, it's what I use when I'm confirming a location. Now, Google Maps has a lot of uh, features and you'll be familiar with most of these, I'm sure, some maybe not. So you have Google Maps and its uh, counterpart, Google Earth, which uh, can have more detail in some ways, not as much in others. But things like rotating a map, zooming in and out, tilting the view, going into street views, by which I mean getting down a street level and seeing the street you're on. Photospheres are very similar to street view in that they're 360 degree views. You can pan right around. The main difference is that you can't then advance to the next one. They're static images in one place. There will be photos appearing in places also on Google Maps and labels, which will give you street names, business names, and often other information. And then one we will go into in a little bit more detail, which is historical imagery. And I will explain why I think it's such a useful feature of Google Maps. If you're familiar with all of these, then whenever you look at another map platform or mapping application, see if they've got equivalents to all these features. As I said with Yandex Maps, it doesn't have Street View, but it does have Panorama, which is sometimes a very good substitute if you're in a place where Google does not have street level coverage. Paying close attention, it should go without saying, but it's a very, very important thing with photographs, Look into every corner, look at everything you can see in the background. Try not to ignore anything you're seeing in a picture. You, you could be surprised by the one thing that could come through for you. I was trying to establish where a guy was a few years ago, and I thought I had looked at everything in the photo and there wasn't really enough information. And then I realized it was quite a high resolution photograph and the guy was wearing sunglasses and they were mirror effect sunglasses. And when I zoomed into the picture, I could see reflected in his sunglasses, the shop on the other side of the street. And I had nearly left that photo without zooming in and checking what I could see in his glasses. But things like this, uh, also reflections in shop windows and other things like this can very often be key to helping you figure out where you are. When you're looking for videos, of course, focus, as I said, on the background, but make sure to pause often in a video because Sometimes somebody will pan or they will zoom in and out or they will lose focus and reacquire focus. And very often it may just be in a split second that you can see the thing that is going to help you geolocate a video. Uh, YouTube is quite useful in this way because with YouTube, you can just use the comma and full stop keys on the keyboard. So you pause the video first and then you can use those and you can go forward and back a single frame at a time. And to give you an idea of how useful this is, a lot of videos, now most videos will be shot in 25 to 30 frames per second, but you will often now even get videos shot at 60 frames per second. And that means that you can 
advance and go backwards in increments of one sixtieth of a second at a time. So even if something just appears for a split second, there is a very good chance that you're going to be able to see it. And again, an example of this was some years ago, I saw an incident that was claimed to have taken place in Sao Paulo in Brazil. And I was trying to geolocate it and it was dark outside and it was chaotic. There were people running around in the street and it was quite difficult to pick out anything. But as I was going through the video, I noticed that the person holding the camera, something hit the window and the person just flinched backwards for a split second. So I went back and I brought it forward a single frame at a time. This was a 30 frames per second video. So I was looking at 1 30th of a second at a time. In just one frame, so seen in the video for 1 30th of a second, when the person flinched backward from the window, you could see a reflection on the inside of the window that was unmistakably a KFC wrapper. So now I had something to look for and I searched on the street where this is claimed to have happened and there were two KFCs. And I checked on Street View, and sure enough, on the map, directly across from the KFC, there was a white concrete bollard. That also appeared in the video. And then there were one or two other small things, but that was the dominating feature. So that single view of 1 60th of a second was what gave me the information I needed to geolocate that video. As I said, don't ignore captions or descriptions because they can bring you very important information. And as you see, this is a tweet saying that there are police clashing with protesters at Bangkok's Democracy Monument. So you've got a city, you've also got a monument named. This helps you immediately zoom into an area and say, this is where I'm going to start looking. And when I went into the video and I went forward, I paused at this point because at the top right, you can see something that looks like a monument. Is that the Democracy Monument in Bangkok? Well, when you go to Bangkok in Google Maps and you go into Street View, you can see exactly that. That's kind of symmetrical and the three or four sides that all look a bit like this. It took me a while to establish which exact section of the monument it was but we were able to say precisely that, yes, this video was shot at the Democracy Monument in Bangkok. So again, with text and with words, you have something to search for. So if you see a video and it says, this is in Sidi Bouzid, for example, in Tunisia, and you see something in the background that looks like a monument, what can you do? Go to Google, search Sidi Bouzid monuments, you can go into image searches, and these may lead you, again, like I said here, if, you, if it says it's in Batrun, uh, and you see a church, try the same thing. You could get a Wikipedia entry, you could get a blog, you could get a travel log or whatever, and these may well have more images that will help you establish, yes, this is definitely Sidi Bouzid, or this is definitely Batrun. So again, always check the search engines. I like to take what I call the engineer's approach, which is use the simplest tool possible until it doesn't work any longer, and only then move on to the more complex things, because they will, of course, take you longer. So always try to start simple and increase the, the level of sophistication as needed. Then reverse image search the photos. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with Google reverse image search. There are other search engines that have similar functions where you can search by the image and the search engine will tell you if that image or something similar is elsewhere online. You can do the same thing if you take a still from a video, take a screen capture and try searching that thing online. You will see when you zoom into certain areas that there will be lots of labels and these things can help you, of course, uh, home in on the approximate location. So you'll see names of businesses, names of streets, and so on. But if you're then trying to look at this in a bit more detail, go down to the layers at the bottom left, go across to more, and you can then turn off labels. And this will give you a far clearer view. So this can be very helpful when you're looking at satellite images, for example, because when you have all those labels on there, it can be very cluttered and very difficult for you to see exactly what you're looking for. Now we're talking about imagery, we're talking about visuals, but don't forget, not with photographs, of course, but with videos, 
you may well also have sound on them. And it's quite common for people involved in a dramatic situation to say where they are. Of course, you know, you don't take that as confirmation in itself, but it does help you to home in on the area. And again, this was something I mentioned, the, uh, the coordinating committees in Syria, this was something they did in the early days when they were holding protests and so on, that they would narrate the beginning of a video and say where they were. And then this then enabled you to go to that area on the map and try to figure out whether they were accurate in what they were saying. But not just place names, things like accents and dialects. Like I said, when I worked with Storyful, uh, when we got our first Arabic speaker, it was uh, a young woman from Syria. And that's where we were getting a huge amount of video from at the time. And Razan was able to look at videos and say, well, this claims to be up in the north near the Turkish border, but those the way that everyone in that video is speaking like somebody who comes from Dara or somewhere way down the south. So I'm quite suspicious about whether this video is where it claims to be. Of course, in areas of conflict, large groups of people will be moved around, but quite often the way people speak may well give you an indication. You might see a video and again, it says it's in, I don't know, for, for example, Syria, but an expert listening to that will say, well, that actually sounds like the people are from Egypt. So again, these are all things that will feed into your investigative process and help you to figure out where something is or indeed where it isn't. Google Street View is something that's extremely useful. Now I will address the fact that it's not as widespread in the Middle East and North Africa area, but in places where it is available, it's really good because you can go in and basically do a virtual tour of an area. Now, with a video, of course, very often the incident or the action will take place over an extended area. That gives you many more potential points to compare between the video and the map. So if you can go into Google Street View, this takes you down to street level, then you can click and you can move around the area. So you can look for more things that you have seen in a video and try to compare them with the maps. And again, it's a very straightforward thing to go into. Here's just one of the last workshops I did was in Taiwan. And it's so helpful there because yeah, when you click on the little yellow man down the bottom right of this, anywhere Street View is available, lights up in blue, and you can see more than half the country has been covered by Google's Street View car. You then get in closer. And if you look at this, you can see the blue lines. These are places where street level views are available, the actual street view that you can follow along streets and so on. You'll also see a number of blue dots, little blue circles. Those are photospheres, which I mentioned a little earlier, that you can go in there and you can get a street view. You just can't move along from there. You have to come out again if you want to go into another one. So you have to come back up to uh, bird level. So they are also helpful because you can go into them and you can pan 360 degrees and get a very good overall view. But to go to the next one, you have to come back out and then go into the one after that. So this is, again, an example. If I clicked on somewhere down by the harbor there, I would come into this. And you can see over on the left, there's a sign that says Cute Kilong. Kilong is a city in uh, Taiwan. So again, it gave me a good idea that I may, may be able to spot that in a video as well. Now, I mentioned historical imagery. This can be helpful in a number of ways. And this might be more relevant in the regions that a lot of you guys are covering because it's not limited to street views. We'll start off by having a look here at how it works in street view. So that if you're looking at an area like this, and if you take a look up at the top left, it says see more dates, because when the Google street car drives around taking pictures, if it passes through the same place again, they don't dump the older image. They keep the earlier images that the, that the car shot in that area. And if there, if there are further historical imagery, you will see them by clicking on where it says see more dates. And when you click on that, you get this timeline down the bottom. I had to change this slide this morning because they've changed the interface there. It looks different to what it used to. But this is what it looks like now. So you will see a whole list of the previous times that the Google Streetcar passed by this spot and took pictures. 
and you just click on any of those and you get the corresponding picture from months or even years earlier. So you can see if changes have occurred in a place. Now, why might this be useful? Well, here's an example. This is from London. And I've been looking at something and it was important for me to know what that building in the background is. And sure, I could compare the square pattern on the wall, but I would like to see a bit more of the building. Unfortunately, when the Google Street View was captured, somebody had parked a big truck in front of the building and another one just further down the street. But of course, the truck wasn't going to be parked there forever and hadn't been parked there forever. Now, it does say Street View August 2017, and this is the old interface. It used to have that little clock icon on the left there. And if you clicked on that, you got a choice to see the other street views. I went back to an earlier street view and I got a very pleasant surprise. Not only was the truck not there on that date, but it was also taken in March and there's no foliage on the trees. So I got uh, two advantages there. I got a clearer view of the building, which you can see is called Orion House. And you can see there's a Starbucks there because you have a much clearer view on a different date. Now it's not only in street view that this uh, is useful. And sometimes you will not have a street view for a lot of parts of the world because it's not like you know Google is allowed to drive its streetcars around, around Syria and so on and other countries like this, like same in, in China or in Russia and so on. So you will have to start, as I say, thinking like a bird and thinking, what can I see in this video that would be distinctive if I were looking at it from above? Because as you can see here, large swathes of Middle East, North Africa have very little street view available. Up until about two years ago, India had none because Google weren't allowed to shoot street views. But look at India now, the entire country is, has been covered very quickly. But for our purposes, we have to look at the region that most of you are operating in. Uh, I would definitely recommend if you are going to be doing quite a bit of uh, geolocation, I would highly recommend downloading Google Earth Pro. It's a standalone desktop uh, tool. Google Earth Pro is also available in the browser, but it's not as powerful as the uh, desktop version. The desktop version has other features, some of which are not really relevant to geolocation work, but one of which is quite important, and I'll go into that in a moment. So you just have, if you if you just search for Google Earth Pro, you'll come to a free download for that. So here, for example, is a video I was asked to check out by a media client a few years ago. And he said, oh, this came into us this morning and it's claimed to show uh, airstrikes in Arbin, in it's a suburb of Damascus. And he said, can you tell me definitively that this is shot in Arbin? And I had a look at it. I'm not familiar with the area. I had a rough idea from looking at other materials, from looking at maps and so on. But I'm not even going to really go forward in the video because this frame is what I really want here. And I looked and I saw, well, there is a mosque with a silver dome. Now, it's distinctive, but is it unique? There may be many mosques all over the, the country and indeed all over the region that also have silver domes. So I'm going to need a little bit more than that. So next to the dome is the minaret. Uh, in front of the dome is a slightly curved facade. Then you have a building over to the lower left of it and you can count, you know, you've got four windows down, two across and you've got some balconies also. And finally, on the bottom right, you have that kind of open structure, a building with some kind of small square structure on the roof. If I can find all of these and they lie in the correct spatial relationship to one another, then I know where this is. So I first zoomed into the Arbin area, started looking around for a silver dome, and there were actually a couple of them, but I then came up with this. Now, this is the satellite view that I was able to compare with the view from the video. And as you can see, you have the silver dome, you have the curved facade in front of it, you have the minaret to the right of it as we look, because I angled the satellite view so that I would be looking from roughly the same direction as the camera. You have the uh, building with the two columns of four windows each and the balconies just to the right of it. And then in the foreground, you have this other building with a small structure on the roof. 
So everything there is in the correct spatial relationship. And you can say to yourself, this is definitely the right spot. The only thing that looks slightly different there is that the building in the foreground looks to be a bit closer in the video than it is on the satellite view. But any of you who work with imagery, anyone who is into photography or videography will recognize the effect caused by a long telephoto lens. That you know, when you shoot something from far away from that perspective, it tends to squeeze things up a little bit closer, make them appear closer than they actually are. And you know, if I were shooting video of an airstrike, I think I would be quite far away with a long lens. So this person was obviously doing the sensible thing. But that is certainly the correct spot. Now, I talked about getting Google Earth Pro, and one of the advantages is that you also have historical imagery. Uh, this is just a shot of Jakarta from the air, just to give you an idea of where that function is in Google Earth Pro. Again, it's up at the top. It's a little icon that looks like a clock with an arrow, and when you click on it, this pops up. It doesn't pop up that large. I've just done this for illustration purposes, but that's where you'll find it. And as you can see there, because satellites are going round and round the Earth all the time, you're going to get far more dates and far more satellite views of an area than you will on Google Street View, where the car has to drive there all every so often. So you look at that timeline there, all the little blue and dark blue parts on it. Each of those is a distinct, separate satellite view of this exact spot. Why might you want to use it? Well, I was trying to look at this city in India, and I got to the satellite view, and I thought, well, I can hardly see a thing here because when the satellite view, when the satellite went over, the sky was covered in cloud. And I wanted to get a clearer view of that railway station on the left, uh, the stadium down below, and a couple of blocks of the city. But what I did was went into the historical view, went back to an earlier date. And fortunately for me, the satellite had also gone over on a clear day. So clearly the difference between these two is very obvious. So you get a much better view in that way. That's one reason you might want to use the satellite view. This is another. I was asked at one point about uh, a video. It's quite an old video that uh, purported to show a protest going on in Syria, in al Tabqa, where there's a big dam nearby. It was a very strategic area. And I looked at some things on the video and thought, yes, I can surely pick those out on the map. Unfortunately, when I went to Google Earth, the buildings that I had been looking at in the video had been destroyed because this was a very strategic spot. Uh, there's a, it's called it's also called Al Taura, Al Taura Al Tabka, and there's a dam there, and there had been uh, major fighting between uh, Islamic State guerrillas and uh, government forces, and a lot of buildings had, as a result, been destroyed. But this had happened after that video had been shot. I wanted to get back and look at what did the area look at like at the time the video was shot. So I went back again on the timeline. And here you can see now you have a very clear view of the buildings just to the north and the east of that, uh, that circle, that roundabout there. And these enabled me to then go back and compare them with the video and say, Yes, this video was definitely shot in Al Tabka, right beside the reservoir and right beside the dam. Another thing that can be very helpful in geolocation is looking at terrain and topography. It's slightly more difficult, but it's something that with a bit of practice, you will find yourself being able to do. This was a photograph that was sent to me by a colleague in India. There had been a border dispute between uh, Indian and Chinese troops, and a few people had been killed. And there was a lot of unrest rising in India, and people were saying, well, our prime minister is a coward. He's not confronting the Chinese. Look what Indira Gandhi would have done. She went up and she addressed the soldiers in the Galvan Valley. And the Galvan Valley is where this more recent incident took place. And they said, why doesn't Modi go to the Galvan Valley? Indira Gandhi went there. But the suspicion was that maybe this photo wasn't actually taken in the Galvan Valley. Maybe it was somewhere else. So again, I did my thing of going and looking at the comments people were making on Twitter and elsewhere. And there was a suggestion that this photo may have been taken in a place called Leh, which is 
not far from there, but but uh, far enough to make a difference in terms of political gesturing and so on. So could I say that this was not the Galvan Valley? Could I say that it was actually somewhere else? And I went and had a look and found that there is an Indian Air Force base in Leh, the other place that was mentioned. Now, looking at this, you've got a very flat piece of terrain in the middle of mountainous country. You have a long piece of roadway that could possibly be a runway or a taxiway. And you have a lot of people in military uniform. Are they Air Force personnel? Quite possibly. Now, looking into the background, you can see quite distinctive set of hills or mountains. And yes, there can be big changes because this photo was obviously taken 30 or 40 years ago. But the thing about Leh, where, this, where I thought this may be, is it's a very arid area. So there was not going to be much change in vegetation. There was not going to be much erosion and so on. And the chances that these mountains still looked exactly the same 40 years later were quite good. So I went into Google Earth. I positioned myself in the middle of the Air Force base in Leh and then tilted the view until it was horizontal and then started to pan around and look at the mountains. It took me a few minutes. It will take you longer if it's something you're coming to fresh, if you're not used to doing it. But eventually on Google Earth, I got this view. And OK, it doesn't look exactly the same, but with a bit of practice and with a bit of experience, you will be able to pick things out like this. Because it didn't look exactly the same, this is why I tried to pick as many points of correspondence or coincidence as I could. So you start on the right there, you see this long slope coming down. Then you have a spur next to it in uh, the red uh, rectangle. You have another distinctive shape in the mountain under the green. You have a set of three or four mountain spurs right over to the left. And then you have a mountain ridge in the background. And sure enough, this is the spot that we're looking at in that photograph. So this enabled me to go back to my colleagues in India and say, this photograph was not shot in the Galvan Valley. It's quite some distance away. It's shot at the Air Force Base in Leh. And here is the Google Earth view to prove that this is Leh and not Galvan. If any of you uh, spotted a couple of years back, BBC did a very good uh, investigative piece from Cameroon, where they uncovered evidence of atrocities by soldiers. And this kind of work did form a part of that investigation as well, where in a video showing the soldiers herding people away to one side, there was a mountain ridge visible in the background. And they were able to find this uh, on Google Maps as well. And People sometimes look at this and think that was a great way to do it. How did they find that? Well, like many of these investigations, it did involve quite a lot of traditional journalism as well. And that is always something that we have to keep in mind. When we learn these new techniques and we get all excited about them, we have to remember that it's our journalistic fundamentals that have brought us this far. Don't forget about those while we're playing with the new toys, while we're uh, making use of the new tools you will always get the best results when you combine your existing skills with the new skills that you learn. So going beyond Google Maps, what else is there that we can use uh, when Google doesn't quite give us what we want? Well, going back to the first case study there, we saw that Yandex Maps got me kicked off on the right road, although I did go back to Google Maps later but I probably would not have found that area on Google if I had not been able to leverage Yandex in the first place. So what are the possible alternatives? There's Bing from Microsoft, and I know a lot of, if you're tech people, you generally go, oh, Microsoft doesn't work. Bing is improving quite a lot. Sometimes you do get greater uh, zoom, greater resolution than you will on Google, and therefore more detail in the views. It's not often the case, but I'll give you an example of where it worked for me. Apple Maps is another one that sometimes the street level views are more up to date than what Google has. Again, it's a minority of cases, but I, again, I can show you an example. So being aware of these and Yandex, like I said, for parts of Eastern Europe, which is so relevant if you're covering international or world news at the moment, Yandex can be very helpful uh, for Russia, Belarus, and some of the other areas around there. 
I did talk about there being very little street level uh, views available in Middle East, North Africa area. This is not a perfect substitute or a perfect alternative, but it does give us a little bit more to work with in some places. Now, Mapillary is, uh, it's user created, user generated. You can get an app that you put on your phone. You can go out, walk down your street, cycle, drive along somewhere and set your map to take an image every three seconds or five seconds or every 10 meters or every half kilometer. And you can then upload these to the Mapillary servers. And after some time, they will be approved. And generally, about 10 to 12 hours later, they will actually appear. So it covers locations that Google doesn't, simply because people can do this with their phone. Uh, you don't have to have a Google car or anything like that to do it. The images are also usually captured, as I say, every few meters or every few seconds. So it can give you a whole pathway along a road or through a, an alleyway or whatever that you won't get elsewhere. The downsides of that is that it is crowdsourced. So its success depends on how many people are actually interested. And also they don't really have much control over the quality and the resolution of the images that are getting uploaded. So sometimes they're not as good as they possibly might be. Also, most of the images are static images. They're not like Google Street View where you can follow along uh, or you can't pan around on them. They'll, they'll just be a static image. So you can't turn 90 or 180 or 270 degrees. However, if you look at this comparison and you'll see that while the coverage is not wonderful, there is currently in the Middle East, North Africa area, a lot more mapillary street level imagery than there is from Google. In Google, in fact, you just see a little piece there uh, just to the, the north of Jeddah, you have a little bit around Bahrain and very little else, except when you get up to uh, Israel and Lebanon. Whereas on mapillary on the left, you can see a whole lot there around the Emirates, around Oman, uh, even quite a bit in Iran. So. It's not going to be perfect, but it's going to be more than what you have at the moment from Google. And I, I somehow I don't see Iran inviting Google into shoot imagery anytime soon. Now, speaking of Iran, this one I thought was a very nice example of how having a couple of different alternatives can give you a much better view and much more information. Uh, this came from a video that I was shown that said it showed people outside a government office in a town in Iran. And I was told where the person said it was and even the street that they said it was on. And I thought, can I confirm this? Now, you've got a wonderful view of the front of the building here. You've got this gateway. You have the columns. You have windows again that would be easy to count. Three sets of six down the side there. And you have this curved facade. And at the top left, you have this repeating 90 degree angle pattern. So this is the kind of thing that I'm not going to have street view for this area, but it's the kind of thing that I may be able to see from a satellite view. So the first thing I did was went to the area on Google Maps and checked the satellite view. And it looks pretty promising. If you look at the center of the image here, you will see what does appear to be, you have the right angles there, you have the curved facade, and you have what may be that gateway again that you see in the in the still from the video. It's good. It's probably the right place, but I would like to have a little more. So I left Google Maps and I started looking at some of the other ones at Apple and Yahoo and so on. And then I went to Bing Maps and I went to the same area. And the interesting thing here is that Google and Microsoft, because of their con contracts and business, they can't get their satellite imagery from the same satellite, the, however their contracts work. So the satellites that they're using will go over in very slightly different orbits. But that slight difference, even from all that way up in the sky, can make a dramatic difference to the imagery that they collect. And when I picked this area on Bing Maps from a slightly different satellite, here's what I got. So you can see that the satellite has literally come over on the opposite side of the street. So instead of with Google, you're having an almost vertical view and you can probably see the back of the building a little bit better. On the Bing view, you have the entire 
front, the facade of the building, you have the curve there, you have the right angles, and you even have a better view of that square archway in the front. But what you have when you've used Google Maps and Bing Maps is almost a, a 360 degree view because you have the rear of the building and you have the front of the building. But in this case, the Bing view is far superior. I had something similar just after this, about three weeks later, the same thing happened again. And like I say, Bing doesn't normally have better views than Google, but it can. Now, this is one from just a couple of weeks ago when there was some uh, rocket fire coming uh, from the West Bank into uh, southern Israel. And there were people in Israel shooting video of the uh, Iron Dome air defense system working. But we were looking at it and saying, is this Iron Dome? Is it fireworks? What is it? Where is this happening? And this video claimed to have been shot in Ashkelon. And I wanted to find out whether this was actually the case. It was uploaded to a Facebook account of a South Asian guy who claimed to be working in Ashkelon. So again, I thought, well, this could be by him, but I want to make sure that I have the correct location here. So we'll just take a quick look at the video. And you can see the trails in the sky. You can hear a few bumps. But then fortunately, he also pans down just a little bit here. And the video does go on over quite a, a, a long period. He shoots later video than at nighttime as well, which claims to again show the Iron Dome system working in Ashkelon as well. Now, I wanted to know, was this video shot in Ashkelon? So I did pause at this point because here it says you're 10 kilometers from Gaza and it's talking about the Iron Dome and so on. But more relevant to me is that you can see lit up at the lower part of the uh, freeze frame there, what looks like a stadium of some kind. You've got a long wall. Earlier in the video, you can see floodlights and you have patterns like footballs along the wall there. And I went, first of all, and this is another map I'm going to introduce. Some of you may be aware of it already, some maybe not. And this is called Wikimapia. I'm sure you're all aware of Wikipedia. Wikimapia is a similar concept in that the information that appears on Wikimapia is user submitted. Now, again, that makes it potentially very unreliable, but you're only looking at it as a waypoint, something to find your way somewhere so you can then carry out further investigation. And one of the great things with Wikimapia is that there's a lot of people who have special interests. So some people will put in lots and lots of information about military information. Others will put in information about sports or religion or so on. And if you look up at the top, you will see it says categories. And there's a drop down there. So I filter for category stadium in the Ashkelon area. Now, if you can see right in the center, there's a little red and white square. And that marks where somebody has put in a listing and said, there is a stadium here. Again, it's user submitted, so it may or may not be reliable. I find very often it is. So I could then take the geographical coordinates for that spot and go into one of the professional maps, in this case, Google Maps. And I went into the street view and I thought, well, it looks like a stadium. It doesn't particularly look like the stadium I was looking at. It has floodlights, it has a low wall, and so on. It might be the right spot. But unfortunately, when you look down at the bottom here in tiny text, you can see that this image was captured in February 2012. And I'm thinking to myself, surely there has to be something more up to date where I can get a better look at that stadium as it may look today. So again, I started going to other mapping applications. And when I got to Apple Maps, and I had a look at the stadium there, and I looked at the areas around it, and sure enough, there was a ground level view of the stadium in Apple Maps. If you look over at the right there, you'll see a pair of binoculars. That icon signifies that you can have a ground level view. And you can see the side of the stadium, and sure enough, it has these footballs, it has the Hebrew text along in the middle, and it has this blue up and down pattern. So I can now say for certain this is the sports stadium in Ashkelon. Therefore, this video was shot in Ashkelon.
Now, something that has come along uh, in leaps and bounds in, in recent years is using reverse image search for geolocation. This is something that was very sketchy up until about a year or two ago because reverse image search wasn't doing particularly well in recognizing buildings and architecture and streetscapes and so on. Now, for a long time, Yandex was performing a little bit better than Google Maps or any of the other mapping services, or the, sorry, I should say not the mapping services, the image search services. And there were buildings that if you tried to look for them in Google, you weren't getting any good results. But then if you went to Yandex, you were getting much better results. And I was a little bit worried about this because Yandex, a few years ago, the Russian government did realize it was becoming very popular. And they basically took a controlling interest in it. So they appointed uh, a government official as a member of the executive board of Yandex. So we were worried at the time saying, well, if there comes a point where uh, open source intelligence becomes a threat to Russian interests, is there a possibility that they will then try to control uh, results and the way things are shaped by the, uh, by the search engine? And of course, now we're in a situation where that's very important to Russia. So we always have to be very careful when we're looking at Yandex results, just in case somebody's messing with them, because it is in a time of crisis, I believe, potentially largely under the control of the government. So fortunately, and I don't say this as a fan or anything, Google has now become extremely good in this field. And of course, yes, they have their agendas as well. And it's a commercial business. So you have to always take what you get from them with a grain of salt also. But that's probably less a hazard than being controlled by a government that's at war. So it's uh, quite a healthy situation at the moment that Google Lens has got very strong on this kind of reverse image search for things like buildings. And I find myself from time to time now, you know, Google Lens works best, or works almost entirely on your phone. You can use it on your desktop, but it's not the same. Uh, where if I'm watching a video or looking at a photograph, I will literally just pick up my phone, open the Google Lens uh, application, turn on the camera and point it at my computer screen. And you can get a lot of success doing this. And it seems to be getting better all the time. In some ways, I find it a little bit frightening, a little bit disturbing, but uh, for purposes of open source intelligence, it has become a very useful tool. It also will do things, of course, like optical character recognition. So you will see signs and uh, other things like that and you can actually translate them in real time. And this can be extremely helpful also. So uh, I have to, uh, I'll have i say, you know, a lot of my work is teaching workshops that are funded by Google. So I don't want to sound like I'm being a salesperson for them, but at the moment, this is becoming a very powerful tool when you're looking at videos and photographs and trying to extract information from them. An example of this was just a few days ago, when I was helping somebody look for video pertaining to the wildfires that are going across Canada at the moment. And the wildfires are so huge that the smoke is going right over huge swathes of the eastern of eastern Canada and even the northeastern United States. You'll probably have seen in the news that even New York City has been hit by these smoke clouds. Now, this is not from New York City, but somebody had posted it online and not said where it was, but they had said, smoke from the wildfires coming across our town. And here was the video. And you can see like clouds of smoke drifting across the city. But of course, for me, what am I looking at there? I'm looking at two very distinctive looking buildings because to me, this shows potential and promise for uh, Google Lens to pick up something for me. So I literally just paused the video at a certain point where those two buildings were clearly visible. And I'll just go back to where I think that was. Uh, it must have been about, where am I? Yeah, back a bit. So I just paused the video there, opened up Google Lens on my camera, pointed at the screen and did a search. And this is what I got. And Google then straight away picked out these two buildings 
and the curved one in front as well. And said, the result it gave me said, this is something called absolute world. Now I'd never heard of absolute world, but you come out of the lens application and you go into your basic search and you search for absolute world. And it tells you absolute world is a residential condominium twin tower skyscraper complex in the five tower absolute city center development in Mississauga, Ontario, Canada. So we know we're on the right track because this is in Eastern Canada. The wildfires are also in Eastern Canada and this is clearly the right place. So then I just got out of the search, went into Google Maps, searched, uh, zoomed in generally in the Ontario area and searched for absolute world and found it there. And even there was very high resolution and high quality 3D imagery available. So you can even look at these buildings almost directly from the side. You can then angle around and I can actually say because of the elevated perspective that the video is shot with and because of where these two towers lie in relation to the curved building next to them, that person with the camera is probably in one of these two square, one of these three square blocks on the bottom right. So uh, I was trying to help my friend in the uh, TV station who were looking for this and I just messaged the woman on Facebook and said to her, uh, we have somebody who's interested in using or getting your permission to use your video from Mississauga of the fire, the smoke from the fires. And she, she messaged me back quite well. She said, how do you know what city I'm in? So I did just sit down and quietly explain to her. I said, this is actually what we do. And, it's, you know, we're not stalking you or anything. It's just ways we have of finding out this kind of information. She was okay with it in the end. And she gave permission. So everybody ended up quite happy. Now, how do you get better at this kind of thing? Like I said, with the Russian one at the start, that took me about 15 to 20 minutes, I think, to work out. And I've set the exercise for students. Some of them have been fast, but it has generally taken them over 30 minutes to do it. I'm not a genius. I have no special uh, claim to being any, any better at this than anybody else. It is simply a matter of practice and of experience. And you will get hunches on what tool to use, what approach to use, what things you can quickly discount and so on. And seriously, the more you do this, the better you will get at it. So use your skills, look at videos online and say, if I didn't know where this was, if I only knew it was a certain city, could I pinpoint that spot? What are the tools I would use? What is the approach? What is the workflow I would use? And so on. And you'll find yourself getting better all the time. Sometimes I have people who really, really enjoy geolocation work, and they want more and more of it, more than I can ever provide to them. And I generally send them in the direction of a website called GeoGuessr. And if you look, it's there, it's geoguessr.com. It's SSR at the end, there's no E before the R. So that's actually how it's spelled. And this is a website that works a bit like a quiz. You do have to set up an account, but it's mostly free after that. I think you can use it free for five minutes out of every 15 minutes at the moment. Uh, so you do little quizzes. They show you a place and you have to guess where in the world it is. And depending how fast and how accurate you are, you get more points. Uh, it can be quite addictive. I know people who get interested in geolocation and they come back to me later and say, why did you tell me about GeoGuessr? I'm wasting half my life on it. Mm -hmm. But uh, it can be very helpful in sharpening your geolocation skills. Now, I'm going to give you some exercises to work on and see how much you picked up, how much you may already have known anyway, and how quickly you can figure out these exercises. Now, before that, uh, we will... Well, I do, well, I do well, want to... Uh, 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 so I'm going to give you about 20 minutes of the exercise, and that will give us about 15 to 20 minutes for questions then at the okay. end. Okay, sure. sure. Uh, so before that, I know very often with people, the question they want to ask only occurs to them after we've finished our workshop. And okay. somebody wakes up in the middle of the night and thinks, why didn't I ask that? Or in two days or a week or a month's time, they think, oh, I should have asked that. The point I want to make here is don't ever feel that you have missed your opportunity to ask a question. These are my contact details. Please feel free to reach out to me. There's my email. Uh, there's my Twitter account. The direct messaging function on that is open, so you don't need me to follow you. You can just direct message me, 
and I will try to get back to you as quickly as possible with the best information I can. Uh, if somebody asks me something very simple, I'll respond to them directly. If somebody asks me a question and I think that's very interesting and the answer to that is potentially helpful to the whole group, then I will give them the answer, but I will also get back to the guys at our fact-checking network and maybe you can share it with the whole group because sometimes somebody asks a question that everybody benefits from the answer. So I want to move on then and give you a couple of exercises to practice this on. So uh, there is a short link there. There's also a QR code. I would highly recommend using the short link rather than the QR code because trying to do geolocation work on your phone is uh, a recipe for eye strain and pain in your neck muscles. So it would be better to open a browser window and go to that is.gd forward slash. The part after the forward slash is case sensitive. So use uppercase letters where necessary and then lowercase. So it's A-R-I-J, all in uppercase, then two, three, and then lowercase Q, Q. And there are basically two exercises, one of them involving a video and one of them involving a photo. So let's get hands on and see what we can achieve. It's now 26 minutes past the hour. Uh, what do you think, Mohammed? Should we give them 15 minutes or 20? Because we do want to leave some time for, for questions at the end, because sometimes that's when the best information comes up. Oh, okay. خلينا نرجع على يعني عشر دقائق على السبعة وثلاثين. Okay. نرجع على ستة وثلاثين. خمسة وثلاثين. Okay, خمسة وثلاثين. You're 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 confident. You're confident in good, Mohammed. Okay, that sounds good. I'm happy with that. You you must have you must have high confidence in this group. I think. So we'll get back at 35 and see, and you can put your answers, everybody, into the chat here. People have access to the chat, don't they? Yeah, they have access to yeah. in the chat. Great. So put your answers into the chat, and we will see 10 minutes from now how well people have done this. Just uh, is the link working for you? Uh, okay, Ahmed Sadiq. Hey, you are the law, but that's why I'll chat. Atta Zamina Ahmed. Okay. Yeah, it may be if somebody uses a lowercase where they should be using uppercase, that sometimes. So it, ha it has to use uppercase and lowercase where where they appear in the original link. Yeah, I'm just checking here. It's definitely active. So if you're not getting through to try entering it again, I'm making sure all the letters are the correct case. اللي ما اشتغل معي جرب الرابط الأخير اللي حطها أحمد على الشات. Okay, I'm just going to turn off my camera for a moment and open a window here. It's getting very warm. Yeah, sure, sure.
سناء سناء وقاصر اللي رافعين ايديكم لو تكتبوا الاسئله على الكيو اند اي اعتقد افضل لانه مش ما فيش عندنا وقت انه ممكن نسمح لكم انه تسالوا السؤال صوت يعني فالافضل انه تحطوا الاسئله على الكيو اند اي افضل لو سمحتوا يعني او اذا في وقت ممكن نرجع لكم في مجموعة من الأجوبة هو. So yeah, are you going to start taking calls for answers? <laughs> yeah. I see there have been a couple of very good answers. I also see some people have been taken in by my trickery. 
which always makes me very happy. <laughs> so I think I might uh, share the Share the screens again. Let's share the screen with the actual exercise. Give me a moment, I'll, I'll reshare so I'm on the correct page. So the first video uh, says that it's in Nagaland in northern India and that there are people in the streets of Dimapur, which is a northern Indian city. Who believes that's true? You see anyone putting anything in the chat there? True or false? What do we think? Not true, says Imad Hassan. Where do you think it is if it's not in Dimapur? Uh, because it says on the uh, caption, it says Naga City. Is Naga City in Nagaland? What part of what country are we looking at? Can anyone tell me? People are being shy. في مجموعة كتبوا إنها في الهند وفي مجموعة كتبوا إنها في كاليفورنيا وفي مجموعة كتبوا إنها الفيديو في authentic. Uh -huh. I see a correct answer in there. The video it says I think Philippines, and that is actually the correct answer. Now I'll just give you a quick look here. Yeah, في ناس جابوا الفلبين عماد حسين. So when you look at the video, sorry, let me pause that for a moment. I just want to uh, get you a better view of it. Let me just reload because I want to get out of that uh, that small view. It's not easy otherwise to see what you need to see. So if you look at the original video here. The person is moving along, and you will see that the caption says Naga City. There's also, as one or two people have spotted, a sign reading Concentrics. Now, what you could do at this point is you could just Google Concentrics Naga City, or you could go to Google Maps and go to Naga City first. If you did that, what you will have found is that. Naga City is in the Philippines. You can get through to there and find this building called Concentrics. Now, Concentrics, as I said earlier about McDonald's or something, it could be a chain. There could be many of them, and their videos, uh, their signs, and their buildings could look the same. But if you continue on in that video, having seen the, the Concentrics building, if you continue on a little further, you will see a round building to the left of the street. You can also find that in the Google Maps Street View of that area. So you can confirm then at that point that you're actually looking at a place called Naga City in the Philippines. You're not looking at Nagaland in India. You're not looking at the city of Dimapur. So the answer to that one was that no, this is not in Dimapur. It is not in uh, India at all. And it's actually in the Philippines. Now, I want to move on quickly to the photo because this is one that uh, I use quite often. And I use it for a very specific purpose because when you look at this, again, I'm going to change the share here. Okay, no, that's all right, yeah. So when you look at this picture, what's the first thing that stands out to you? There's a big yellow American school bus. So your first instinct will be, of course, well, this is in America. What does it say on the side of the school bus? Sequoia Union High School District. 
If you Google that and search for it, you'll find Redwood City, California. However, that was a bit too quick and easy. It's most certainly not in Redwood City, California. Other people may have caught their eye with the sign over to the left of the poster that says Mississippi. And indeed, a couple of people did guess Jackson, Mississippi. That's not the correct answer either. Uh, was it Koblenz in Germany? Well, if you searched for the shop sign you see on the right, Debeka, you will see that Debeka is an insurance company with its headquarters in Koblenz. That's not the answer either. So I see a couple of people said Debeka is the key. It is indeed, but Debeka, of course, it's a big insurance company and it has branches all throughout Germany. Uh, including just down the street from where I live. Now, this photo I took when I was out walking one morning because I saw the bus and thought, that's going to be a good red herring. It's going to be a good fake clue to mislead people. Then I saw the Mississippi poster and I thought, even better. And what you have to do here, the key to finding exactly where this is, is looking for Debeka, but also looking for the phone number that's on the sign. And if you Google Debeka and that phone number, you will get a result that will lead you to a branch office in Langhansstrasse in Berlin, near where I live. And I see indeed at least one person, two or three people actually did get this correct. So very well done to anyone who got that. But like I said, I didn't do this just to trick people and fool people. The point to be made here is that when you're searching for geolocation or indeed anything, you can be misled as easily by what you do know as by what you don't know. Sometimes you will see what looks like a really good clue early on and your mind can become fixated on that. And you can ignore every other piece of evidence that might be there because something stands out as being the correct answer. So the lesson to learn from this, if you thought this was in California or Mississippi or Koblenz, is to slow down and to doubt things and to try to get as much of the information as you can before you jump and say, I know where this is. So you have the bus, you have the poster, but you also have the sign and you have the phone number on the sign. And in the end, that's what actually made it possible <clears throat> to geolocate this to an exact spot. So I don't want to go on too much because I want to leave time to get some of, we seem to have quite a few questions in the Q&A. And I can Google Translate or Mohammed, you can give me a question. Let's start with 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 a question. And also quite complicated and far less satisfying the geolocation because trying to ascertain time can be something that's very difficult and never quite as satisfying as location. As you've already mentioned, which is an important point, checking weather can be one thing because they might say this happened this morning and you see snow in the background and you look at the weather for this morning and it was 38 degrees. So that would make you suspicious. Other things can be, for example, uh, is, is there plant life in the background? Should certain types of plants be blooming at that time of year? Uh, sometimes some of the ways I've found things is events going on or posters up on walls. Uh, and you can, you can search for these and find that something was going on at that time. But it is far more difficult than geolocation. And you're having, again, to look at every small detail you can find and seeing is there something like an event, like plants, like weather, and so on. Uh, is, is somebody, it's, it's very rare you'll see somebody these days holding a newspaper, so that's not really as helpful as it used to be. But uh, yeah, that's, that's about the best I can do for you right now. في حال وجود إشارة داخل الفيديو أو الصورة لكن هذه الإشارة شكلها صغير أو غير واضحة ريزولوشن تبعها مش كبير خاصة إذا كانت صورة أو الفيديوهات دقتها ضعيفة ما هو الحل؟ Yeah. 
there's always the possibility that you can improve your view of something by, for example, taking a screen grab, importing it into a photo editor and increasing things like sharpness and local contrast and so on. But there will be physical limits on what you can do. And one of the most important things is knowing when to give up on something because sometimes you have to just say, I have increase the resolution and the sharpness and it's just not visible and I'm going to have to try to find another clue I'm not going to kill any more of my time on this it's happened from time to time that I've been able to improve my view of something and get the information but more often than not if it starts off very low resolution there there are no miracles to be performed أه طيب قبل السؤال قبل الاسئله الجايه لكل المشاركين اللي حابين توصلهم الماده التدريبيه تبع الويبنار يرجع تعبئات نموذج التقييم الموجود على الشات قبل قبل انتهاء الويبنار لو سمحتم طيب السؤال الثالث عنوان ما هي انسب اداه لتتبع مسار سياره يطلق يطلق قائدها الرصاص على المواطنين يعني في حال الفيديوهات الموجوده في المظاهرات وكان في على سبيل المثال سياري يطلق قائد الرصاص على المواطنين اثناء الاحتجاجات مثلا ما هي الانسب ادل تتبع المسار السياره او مسار اطلاق النار oh when you say track the car um you mean the location or you mean the ownership um i'm not, I'm not sure exactly what the um yeah, because... مكان 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 مسار السياره من بداية اطلاق النار الى yeah. نهاية الفيديو مثلا. Yeah. In, in that case, you're talking about trying to find multiple pieces of content showing the same car. I've seen things done in this way. Uh, an old colleague of mine, Maliki Brown, now runs the visual investigations team in the New York Times. And they have done stuff where they've tracked somebody over a path and over time. But you are you you will need to find multiple pictures or videos and then try to ascertain the times they were taken and so on to see, okay, he was here at this time, then he was here and so on. And it's about building a, a more comprehensive picture through, through, as I say, multiple pieces of content. Thank you, Awan. What if the picture was in a place where it was broken? For example, if the picture was taken inside a conference room or a conference room, ويرد تاكد من من الصوره نفسها. Yeah, in this case, uh, again, search engines are, are your friend because, uh, you know, there are some buildings where you can see the, their, um, you can see inside them on Google Maps or Google Street View. Sometimes you will actually get a view inside a building. Just the most obvious example, Madison Square Garden in New York, you can go right down onto the basketball court in Google Street View. But um, more often than not, you won't have views inside buildings. So in that case, you need to start going to search engines and trying to see if you can find photographs or indeed other videos that people have uploaded. And they've said, well, I'm inside the conference center in Riyadh or wherever. So you're not going to really get on the mapping applications at that point. You're going to have to look for other imagery. And again, that will be judicious use of search engines that will help you to do that. آه، معظم الأمثلة أو الأدوات اللي تحدثت عنها خلال الويبنار كانت معظمها مجانية هل هناك مواقع أو أدوات غير مجانية ومدى الاستفادة منها بيكون أكبر من المواقع المجانية وما هي؟ uh, I tend to be reluctant largely because you can do so much with the free tools for starters and Sometimes people start getting interested in throwing money at something before they have exhausted the possibilities of the free tools. Uh, also for the reason that the paid for tools tend to be extremely expensive. Uh, for example, with satellite imagery, you will never get uh, anything really up to date without paying very large amounts of money for it. And I know even some very big News organizations will only do that on a case-by-case -case basis when they think it's absolutely necessary. Uh, for example, Google, Google's free imagery, the satellite imagery will rarely be newer than 30 days old. There are companies like Maxar and so on that will 
provide you with slightly more up-to-date stuff, but it'll be very, very expensive. And even then, because of security concerns, there are limits on how recent the imagery they can give you will be. I tend also myself to teach most of the free tools largely because most of the people I do workshops for do not have this kind of budget. And we're talking about serious money. صحيح في سؤال في في المناطق اللي مثلا انتهت او دمرت بشكل كامل مثلا في سوريا او في العراق او حاليا في اوكرانيا يعني ما معنى جغرافيه المنطقه او المكان تغيرت ما هي المنهجيه او النصائح اللي ممكن تنصح فيها المهتمين بتدقيق المحتوى الفيديوهات الصور اللي ممكن يتبعوها لتدقيق محتوى فيديو يشاع انه صادر yeah. It's very difficult when you have places like that where, you know, I've seen, for example, uh, obviously the one I keep coming back to is Syria because it's the one I've looked at most from, but I look at places like um, like homes like Baba Amr, uh, places like Ariha and, and parts of uh, Aleppo. And, you know, when you look at them, large sections are basically just piles of rubble. Uh, so there are times when you look at a place and there are no distinctive features visible because all you're seeing is broken concrete and so on so you are having to look very carefully through a video or very carefully at a photograph and try to see if there is anything at all that is uh distinctive now of course with the earthquake a few months ago that was a huge issue because you were saying oh this happened in uh for example uh gender is and the city was almost flattened. And then you looked at satellite views and it was really difficult to tell whether that was the same place. But I did, for example, geolocate one where uh, it was a video from the, the White Helmets uh, in Genderis and it was drone video. But when, I, and because you know, a lot of people attack them and criticize them and say they're making things up. Sorry. It was a place in north northwest Syria, I believe. I, I believe the pronunciation is genderis, but I'm not I'm not an Arabic speaker, so I'm trying to follow it from the English spelling. But it's just over the border from Turkey into Syria. And the the white helmets were rescuing people there and they were shooting drone video. And clearly the city now looked very different from what it did on satellite views on maps. But one piece of video I was able to confirm was simply by looking at almost like the footprint of a building. So you could see shapes on the ground, which meant that there were four square buildings and a rectangular building that were now gone. But the shape of where they had been, or as I said, the footprint was still there. And you could compare that to old satellite views. Sometimes that will help you. Sometimes it could be something as simple as a tree that's left standing beside a building that looks looks the same as it did before. Uh, you're having to deal with very sparse information and you just have to do the best you can with it. But just a, a, a thing again on historical views. We, I saw some a few very good pieces of journalism done using Google Earth historical views, showing, for example, progressive destruction of towns and villages and cities across Syria. I saw another very good piece where they looked at northern Myanmar, where the Rohingya people were uh, attacked and chased out and their villages burned. And somebody had used Google Earth to show there were a group of thriving Rohingya villages here. And now there are just scorch marks on the earth. So even destruction has its place in, in visual reporting. Like I said, if you do think of a question at a later time, please don't feel shy and please get in touch with me and I'll do the best I can. يوجد الكثير من الأسئلة بس أعتقد إنه الوقت داهمنا بس سؤال أخير في دقيقتين أو مع دخول الذكاء الاصطناعي ألا ترى صعوبة التحقق من الفيديو مستقبلا ما رأيك؟
آه. 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 مع دخول الذكاء الاصطناعي الاي اي الا ترى صعوبه التحقق من الفيديو مستقبلا Certainly I do, <laughs> and, but it is a double-edged sword also because I know that there are people who are saying, oh, here's our, here comes artificial intelligence, we're all doomed, we're never going to know reality from fiction again. And in certain ways that's possible because when you see how much the quality of artificially created image, imagery has improved in the past few years, it's breathtaking and it's quite scary. However, it does mean that, you know, quite soon, a lot of video and photos will not be possible for ordinary people like me and you to look at them and say it's real or false. But this is where our old backup skills and fundamental journalistic tendencies will come into play because we have to start looking at things like context, like corroboration. Uh, for example, you know, this video shows this incident happening. Have we seen anybody else say that that incident happened? Because as journalists, what was one of the first things we were always taught was do not take information as reliable if it came from a single source. So if the only source is one video and everybody else seems to be deriving their information from that, then you have to take a step back and start asking the hard questions all around. Uh, the other reason I said it's a double-edged sword is because I'm starting to see applications for artificial intelligence in helping us also. Because sometimes I will see something and a reverse image search, for example, is not finding it for me and I can't dig it out. And I've tried asking, for example, ChatGPT, uh, do you know of a company logo that has a triangle with a circle offset to one side of it? And usually it doesn't work, but I have had a couple of cases where it has, or I've described a building and it's found it for me. So again, like the fakes are getting much better, I expect that side of artificial intelligence also to improve. And maybe maybe it's not just a weapon against us. Maybe we can use it in our favor also. صحيح أوان قبل ما نختم حاب بس أذكركم بشغلتين الشغلة الأولى ما تنسوا ما قبل ما تطلعوا تعبوا التقييم الخاص بالويبنار والمشارك معكم على الشات يعني قبل ما تسكروا الزوم لو تكرمتم انه تعبوا التقييم والشيء الثاني ما ننسى كلنا جميعا تشاركونا في ويبنار دليل الثاني بعنوان فن مقابلة المصادر لتلقي المعلومات والصحفيين مع المدير العام لشبكة أريج روان الضامن واللي حيكون يوم 3 تموز يوليو الجاي من الساعة 6 للساعة 8 مساء بتوقيت عمان ما تنسوا ما تسجلوا في الويبنار وما تنسوا تعبوا التقييم الخاص بالويبنار الحالي واللي مشارك معكم على التشات في الأخير أوان شكرا جزيلا كان ويبنار ممتع و... ومليء ومليء مليء بالمعلومات ودسم ومحتاج أن نتبع نصائحك اللي ذكرتها في البداية أنه الممارسة 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 وعدم اليأس ونحاول أنه نتعلم ونستفيد من المواقع المجانية بقدر الإمكان في الأخير شكرا جزيلا شكرا لكم جميعا على المشاركة وانتظرونا في الوبنار القادم Thank you Owen Thank you so much for having me It's been a huge pleasure and a privilege to, to be here So I enjoyed it very much شكرا جزيلا يعطيكم الفعل